Okay, here we go. Hello! Welcome to another Rahala Stepper. Uh, this time it's with John Finnamore. Uh, if you enjoy these podcasts and would like to give me some money, I am on tour uh, from February right through to June 2016 with my show Happy Now. If that goes well, I can afford to do more Rahala Steppers in, in June and then in the autumn as well. They're already booked in. I'm doing them. Don't worry about it. Uh, but anyway, go to richardchain.com slash gigs and you can see information about all of the tour dates. Uh, it's good. It's called Happy Now. It's all about whether happiness is attainable and possible. Look at my happy face. Anyway, here we are. Richard Herring's Left the Square Theatre Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who might vomit during this podcast. <laughs> Genuinely might. So keep what don't if you're listening on audio, go to the video to watch this. <laughs> Could be worth it. It's Richard Herring! <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Welcome to Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast tour. I was in that um, ca- cereal cafe in Hoxton where, and, and, and everyone there had started calling this Rahula Stipper. That's why I don't know what it was. Oh, must, must be getting around somewhere to all the cool, the cool people. They all have beards now, the cool people. That's, it's confusing, isn't it, for someone like you? Because you know, you're still, you don't look, you still don't look cool. I just... <laughs> Just verify that for the people at home. They, it's not, you're getting quite a lot of uh, footage uh, in, uh, of you. Uh, so I'm a bit hungover. I, was, I, uh, I, I went out last night, which is quite rare, and we, we had a kind of pass because my mother-in-law was looking after our tiny baby. So we got really, properly the most pissed I've been. You know, it's, the, it's the downside of doing these on a Sunday afternoon, really, is that's the bad thing, is you go out on a Saturday night. I'm really, seriously, ho- horrible. I went to uh, Steve Coogan's 50th birthday party. It's difficult to know what to, uh, what to, I don't have a heli invited me, but he, I think he was being kind to invite people from his, uh, even very early on in his career. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's difficult, you know, Steve Coogan, once you get Steve Coogan, he's the man who has everything, you can't get him, no point in getting him cocaine and prostitutes, he's got those. <laughs> so I, what I thought I'd give him, I'd just give him a card saying, I hereby rescind all my rights to the Alan Partridge character. <laughs> that is like, like a million pounds I've basically given him for his book. But I didn't, I got him some chocolates instead, because I, I did think, I don't want to do that, just in case. I do soon, I'm sick in the back of my mouth there. Uh, so, um, <laughs> seriously, it was uh, awful. We were gonna just stay for the first bit, and, and, but then we stayed till, uh, I stayed up till like two o'clock in the morning, that's, I'm 48 years old, it's pathetic. Uh, I do want to read, this is from a man called Rob Forth. Are you in, Rob? No. Uh, he was in last week's, or one of the last week's episodes, uh, and, uh, we were talking about sterling silver, if you were there. He says, I was the beard, beardy guy at the podcast on Sunday who told you the origins of the word sterling to describe the pound couldn't possibly come from silver because, as everyone knows, the pound was based on the gold standard. Well, it turns out it was completely wrong, and the gold standard only came in the 18th century. Prior to that, the value of the pound was, in fact, based on the value of a pound of sterling silver, like I said. <laughs> Here's a link to the article that explains it further. Te- telegraph.co.uk. Uh, please feel free to out me as a fucking idiot that I am. <laughs> In a cruel twist of irony, I contributed 60 of the aforementioned pounds sterling to the Kickstarter, thus guaranteeing there'll be video evidence of my wrongness over the humanity. Uh, so that is from, that's from Rob Forth. Rob Forth, that's kind of quite, that's, that's like a good name for a, for a burglar, isn't it? Rob, go, go forth and rob. Uh, but anyway, there we go. You can have that as well, uh, Andy. That's yes, that's for you. Uh, and uh, oh, no, and the, my other big news was I did a gig at the Albert Hall with Cliff Richard uh, on Friday. I'm really hobnobbing. I with that. There was all sorts. Uh, I was at was, uh, Steve Coogan's party. There were so many people who'd be brilliant guests on uh, Rehearsal for Hours, but but I, I felt it was inappropriate to ask them. And I talked to Julia Davis, who I really wanted to get on. I've never talked to her in my life before, and I was I was I was very drunk and very tired. And I said, yes, we've had your friend on, uh, the, the, you know, the, your, and then I couldn't remember uh, Jessica Hines' name. Uh, and literally for a minute, just had to stand there try, until I went playing charades, basically. And, you know, your friend. 
I don't think your friend, she was in space. I mean, how embarrassing is that? So I don't think Julia Davis will be coming on. And if she does, I won't remember what her name is. Uh, but yeah, I was on, I was, I, we, I'm doing a gigs at the Royal Albert Hall on Friday nights, but uh, comparing in the little room called the Elgar Rooms, I'm sure Edward Elgar is delighted <laughs> that, he, <laughs> that I am swearing in his room. Uh, and uh, uh, Cliff Richard was on the, the, main, in the main stage. He was doing, he's doing well for a 75 year old man. Uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> got away with that, and he so it's uh, it's <laughs> but his uh, honestly, I, I when I arrived there, it's always the interval, and his fans were kind of I mean, they're really so ancient, his they just kind of they were all kind of hobbling along in that. It, it was genuinely like being in a kind of benign episode of The Walking Dead, it, it really was. There wasn't a single person under 80 there, I would say, though you know, on the plus side, that did mean they were safe, so um, they were safe. <laughs> They were safe to be there. So, um, <laughs> uh, so it was like being weird being heckled by Cliff Richard was playing, you know, he was calling me a devil woman all the way through my set. So it's hard to come back for that one. Anyway, look, we're going to crack straight on. Our guest today is probably best known as the narrator of the, the Dave program, 24 Hours to Go Broke, which I'm sure. <laughs> Sure, you'll watch. <laughs> it's John Finnamore, ladies and gentlemen. It's John Finnamore. Here he is. Hooray. Come on in. Welcome. Sit down. Pick up a microphone. Talk into the microphone. It's uh, very low tech. How are you doing? It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Very lovely to be here. And uh, what do you remember about uh, the uh, 24 hours to go broke <laughs> job? It's um, been quite, quite What I time. mostly remember was that they basically wanted. I mean, they never told me this, but it was clear from the script and from the direction, they wanted Dave Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not Dave Lamb, but no. I sort of did more and more of an impression of Dave Lamb. Uh, and they seemed happy with that. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember <laughs> the episode I was in? I do, yeah. yeah you had a lovely time. <laughs> it was kind of an insane... I don't know if you saw the show. It's kind of... Not, I, I, I like to hope that people don't see the stuff like that. Because they pay quite well, and then and it's quite an embarrassing show where you go and... We had to go to Armenia and spend as much money as we could. It was an odd one, wasn't it? Because it felt like there was some... And people did criticise it. It felt <laughs> like there was something a bit queasy. So you're given... The production company gave two comedians a big sum of money and they had to go to a poor part of Europe. But not like really poor, but quite poor, like Armenia or Iceland. Well, Iceland's not... No, it is. Uh, <laughs> and, and spend it on stuff. And it kind of feels wrong. But then when you analyse it, there's nothing wrong about it. They're putting the money into the community. It's fine, yeah. but it just doesn't feel right, does it? It doesn't feel right. We did try to get... And you did make a lot out of that. Well, we that was it was you interesting, because we were being criticised before it even started. And I did think, you know, I was queasy about doing it a little bit, because so I think this you know, might be judged in the wrong way. But then I thought, you know, we want to try and get as much money to nice people as possible. Yeah. But you still... It, we, it was very difficult. It was something like... I think I've spent... I don't even have to, it was £10,000. Yeah. I think it might have been £8,000 because it was so difficult to spend £10,000 in Armenia. <laughs> right. Everything was so cheap. Yeah. So even going to the pot, we, we booked the presidential suite for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and it was still like 100 quid or something. So, uh, but, so, and then we went to a casino. And there was so I that, well, that money didn't go to the poor people of Armenia. I remember now being in my little voiceover booth, uh, realising that it was my job today to commentate on Richard Herring and David Baddiel feeding each other chocolates in dressing gowns. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And yet, you know, when I told my careers advisor that's what I wanted to do, he laughed at me. <laughs> we had a really, uh, the, my favourite thing about it is we, had, we were in the presidential suite and we wanted to get like some sandwiches or whatever. Put, but <laughs> yeah. and we rang down and the guy was so grumpy. The most furious <laughs> major <laughs> in the world. Like, yeah. It was like room service going, he didn't want to bring us whatever yeah. he had. And he didn't have any of the stuff we wanted. It was, um, it was, you know, I enjoyed it, but uh, there we go. I don't think anyone else did. Uh, so I've been, I've been having a lovely time this morning uh, through my hangover <laughs> listening to you uh, on, on your various uh, programmes, which I... Uh, that is how they're best experienced, yeah, yeah, when, you, when you wish you were dead. Through yeah. a fuck. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you've done... I mean, you, we were talking backstage about you obviously do a lot of work on uh, Radio 4. Mm -hmm. So you've got your own yep. sketch show, you've got uh, your own sitcom, yep. which has just come to an end. Uh, yep. And uh, you do things like The Now Show. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting to be, the interesting to me that you, uh, as a writer, writing for the radio is not very well paid. No. And not that many people necessarily hear what you're doing. True. Uh, <laughs> which has kind of put me, kind of put me off. 
<laughs> but it's, there's, it, there's an incredible standard to it. And I was, I was asking because I, I wondered if you had lots of writers on the souvenir program. But you write that yourself as well. No, I like some megalomaniac yeah. idiot. I write the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, that's a lot of work. How many series of the of the sketch? Uh, we're just about to do our fifth. Right. So yeah, and each one is three hours of material. And in order to get three hours of material, I like I need to write four hours of material. Right. Um, and I don't really have returning no. characters or catchphrases either. No. Um, and I kind of made a rod for my own back there. Because when it started, it was just at the, um, like the peak of all that, any sketch show that was on was, was all you know, religiously catchphrases. And so I wanted to not, you know, like the same character just doing the same sketch in, yeah. a different, in a different set. And I really wanted not to do that. And so now I've kind of committed myself to coming <laughs> out with, with half an hour of entirely new ideas each, each episode. Yeah. Um, but I love it. I mean, it's a job I always, it really the job I always wanted to have. Yeah. Um, and I get to do it with a gang of friends, which is a lovely feeling, and, and uh, including Margaret, who yeah. works with you a lot. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, it is, I, I can't complain about it because it's, I know I have co com complete control well, over it. Really. That's, I suppose, perhaps if the answer to your question about, you know, why work for radio if, it, if it's, you know, it's not well paid. But you, once they say you can do it, it's quite hard to get them to say, to commission it, but once they do, they more or less leave you and your producer alone yeah, to, well that's to, true. to make the show. And so you can make the show that you think is the funniest possible, and then yeah. they can decide if they want any more. Yeah, it's, it's quite, I mean, sketches, I, you know, I, I started to write sketches yeah. at university, as I presume did, you did yeah. as well. But it, even when I was doing it, it felt like quite an old fashioned medium. Oh, yeah. It's come back and forth a little bit, but it yeah. does, there's, I mean, a lot of your stuff has that kind of feel of being, while still being quite current and still being. It has a, has oh, a sort of nostalgic I'm feeling to it. So. Absolutely, and especially on the radio, that yeah. adds to that. And I, I do like a sort of, I, I, I like a sketch with a, I just think there's something about the classical structure and having a proper punchline, for instance, yeah. that, that all of my favourite sketches did. And so, yeah, I've, I've, I've become comfortable with literally opening a sketch with the sound, with an old-fashioned doorbell, <laughs> and shop door going ding, ding, and me go, good morning, madam. <laughs> because sometimes that's the best, easiest way to get into a sketch, and yeah. to, to, to try too hard to avoid it uh, just you know, you just end up with 30 seconds of dead time before you get to the first joke. Yeah. And, but cabin pressure feels like a little bit, is it, is it, is it a nod to things like the Navy Lark and stuff like that? It feels, it feels it has a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I don't know how conscious that was. There's definitely, uh, there's also a, there's a kind of dad's army thing about the central dynamic of yeah. the, the one in charge who isn't confident to be in charge and, there's, and, the, and the second in command who really ought to be in charge. You know, yeah. that's straightforward Mannering and Wilson. Yes. And so, okay. yeah, I think it's got a lot of, and the thing is, you know, it's they're all it's all really good what you're doing. It doesn't you work really hard at it? You don't you don't need to work that hard as the radio. So I don't need to. You don't need to work as hard as that because it's just going on the radio. So you should, <laughs> you shouldn't. I feel sorry for you. Obviously, like with the oh, damn with cabin pressure. I was listening. <laughs> I thinking, you must have worked for like a two or three weeks on this one script. Oh yeah, yeah. No. And you know, you've been paid maybe five hundred quid. <laughs> that's, well, that's not really. You know, don't work so hard. Just just. <laughs> Just phone it in no, more. Don't okay. try it. So right, it's really, you. it's really. Thank good. you, Uncle Rich. And I'm sure this is good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what I will write it down. That's what I did. I, when I read radio stuff, I just didn't work that hard on it. And <laughs> uh, yeah, they won't have me back anymore. That's weird. Uh, and you won a silver Sony award. Yeah, that's the best you can get. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Second There's no best, higher accolade second than best silver. To bronze. That, the, the <laughs> bronze well, I was going to ask if you were disappointed you didn't. We got the bronze the, well, the year before. For the, for the, was it for this? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, because yeah. I was there not winning it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> we briefly interviewed you in that. Uh, oh, so yeah. it was 2014. You've asked, you, you own that Sony Award forever now because that was the last Sony Award. Yeah, that's so right. So you yeah. are the current silver Sony Award oh, forever. Oh, I see. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. As long that. as it Yeah, runs. great. Good. Unless it comes back. <laughs> Uh, and uh, well, we came, you had 22,854 people apply for the 200 tickets for yeah. the last episode. Yeah. So that's yeah, quite that a successful sitcom. Yeah, like, I, I mean know they're free tickets, but even so, that yeah. is, that's, a, that's a good hit rate. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was extraordinary. And obviously there was a, a great big Benedict Cumberbatch shaped reason yeah. for that, but nonetheless. Well, I think it's definitely part of it, obviously. I think it would be foolish to say it wasn't, but, it's, but I think that's the, that's the level of uh, fandom you have for it. It's, you did... To about 20, did you do 26 episodes or 27 episodes? I like to call it 26. Yeah. We ended up splitting the lot because, uh, as you know, but others may, may not, uh, they happen to be all, um, they're all <laughs> named after the destination that the, the, it's set in an airline and it's named after the destination the plane's flying to that week. And so I do an alphabet's worth. And, uh, but then we ended up splitting the final episode, Zurich, into two yeah. episodes because 
half an hour wasn't long enough, and uh, so it's sort of 27, but I think of it, I think of that as a two-parter. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So do you feel you can't, because couldn't you now go to places that start A, A, B, B, so, I mean, it's quite hard. Uh, yeah, Aaron's, no, you Aaron's Hill you could do, that's in Somerset, that's the first oh, one. Oh, I see, it's starting at A, I was yeah. thinking more Addis Ababa, Oh, Arden, can do that as well. Chipping Camden. I mean, that, would, <laughs> that would be Let's possible. Let's all fly to Chipping Camden. Well, in my system, it, when you get to Baba, it gets quite hard to yeah, think yeah, about. Your, it might be your system works for one <laughs> <laughs> extra episode. Or <laughs> they could end in A. So you could go ah, to, that's true. And then end in B, then end in yeah, C. Yeah. That would be nice. As sort of, then it's a mirror image all the yeah, way through. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but to be honest, I didn't, I didn't just go, if only there were more <laughs> letters, I would carry this on. That was, it was part of the reason I stopped there, but not maybe, maybe the whole reason. <laughs> and so Benedict became famous sort of halfway yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was extraordinary. So uh, basically, Sherlock started after series two of Cabin Pressure, right. and then we did a Christmas special between series two and three, and that was the one where I arrived at the theatre, and there was just a queue of teenage girls right, literally around the block of the you know the Rada Theatre yeah. in Cheney Street, and uh, never seen I'd never seen that in that location before. <laughs> that was extraordinary. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before, but it, 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 uh, I, I was terrified at that moment because I thought, this is going to be a disaster. They're all here purely for him. They've no idea what this sitcom is. They've probably not much idea what Radio 4 is. They're not going to be listening to the plot. They're not going to care about anything except, uh, you know, when he opens his mouth. And I was absolutely wrong, both yeah. then and subsequently. They were a lovely, intelligent audience. And yeah, they, they squealed when he said something <laughs> vaguely sexy, but they also listened to Stephanie Cole and laughed at her j jokes as well. They were yeah. great and continue to be great. They have conventions now. They have international <laughs> conventions. <laughs> this year's was in Berlin. <laughs> Are they, they doing them in characters? alphabetical order? Are they doing each convention? <laughs> 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 the convention I can't too. believe they missed that trick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but it's a very, it's a very good cast. I mean, you, you tried yeah. to do it for the TV, or did it, is it you're saying? That we you had a, yeah, we had a go, um, but and it's never been officially turned down, but um, no. it's looking less and less likely. Because um, they're yeah. they're very strong characters. They're really brilliant actors in oh, it, you. and you are also in it. Yes, yeah. there's <laughs> three brilliant actors, and then this, and then this guy. I mean, you can imagine how much I felt that on the first, yeah. the first recording, though. You know, like sure. the, so it's, um, you know, in case you don't know it, as many of you want, it's Benedict Cumberbatch, Roger Allen, and Stephanie Cole. Now that cast. Even then, even before Sherlock, they could have, for instance, opened a new play at the National. You know, if you heard that, oh, such and such a play will be starring, it's the three-hander with those three, you go, yep, yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds about right, perfectly reasonable. And they're all doing this stupid Radio 4 sitcom that no one's ever heard of because it's brand new, and I'm in it. There am I saying, yeah, I'm also one of the quartet of actors. <laughs> so, yeah, I was a bit terrified. But um, it, that, you're very good at it. It's very funny. I was well, I wrote myself a comedy, you know, I get yeah. to be the comedy idiot, so I don't have to do any acting, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> So there's two episodes where I do have to do some acting, and uh, both of which I play against the, um, a, a recurring guest star, Timothy West, as my father, yeah. as my character's father. And the, so there's these two scenes where I sort of have to, uh, you know, there's Roger and Ben next to him, and, so, <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to trying to do my acting face. It was it was terrifying. <laughs> so you studied um, at uh, Cambridge University. You did a dissertation on Thomas Hardy. I did, yes. Icon, icons, Frames and Freedom in Jude the Obscure. I, yes, I'd forgotten the title, but what? yes, it was definitely, a, it was definitely what? about Jude the Obscure. I what know that much. What is your fam favourite frame in Jude the Obscure? There's <laughs> 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 this lovely big wooden one. Around the, um, uh, the bit of Jude the Obscure you would like is yeah. where uh, somebody flirts with Jude the Obscure. Oh, yeah. You know this? No, I don't. By know. throwing a bull's pizzle at him. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> now they're all at work in the farm, and uh, she thinks he's a bit of all right, so she expresses her affection by lobbing a bull's pizzle well, at yeah, him. Yeah, they use them as whips. They Is that right? Yeah, well, that's uh, when I went to the Icelandic Penis Museum. Ah, of course, yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> well, this is why I thought of you. <laughs> I know, exactly. I, I do know all about I know who'll like this. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about the genitalia of every animal, especially Icelandic ones. So, yeah, they it's have... It's like they, a weird superpower. Yeah, <laughs> they, they use them to drive cattle. Right, yeah, okay, nice. okay. I think uh, Emma Kennedy was... Uh, I was reading today. I think it was Jude the Obscure. Does he go to Oxford? Jude, does he does, Jude yeah. the yeah. Obscure? Does he go? To <laughs> he does. <laughs> he does. He, he obscurely goes. But she was. Uh, she was. route to Oxford. Sh she was inspired to go to Oxford because of Jude the Obscure. Really? To Oxford. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have a very nice time there. Yeah. I w I'd be surprised. Did she finish the book? <laughs> <laughs> I think she did admit. It's never the moral nice. of the story is basically: don't go to Oxford. <laughs> Your children <laughs> will kill themselves. <laughs> Why is he? I don't want to read the book. 
What's it about? Why is he called Jude the Obscure? <laughs> why is he Jude the Obscure? What's He's going obscure on? because he lives in rural Dorset and okay. he wants to go to Oxford. And What's his actual name? Uh, Forley, I think. Okay. Well, yeah. I think you did quite well. <laughs> uh, did better than I expected on that. You may so have made that up. <laughs> no, I'm fairly sure it's Paulie. Were you in an episode of the of Family Guy? I'm, yeah, I was. <laughs> Just, I still don't know why. <laughs> I mean, obviously, someone dropped out. But even even given... No, I mean, that's just an obvious fact. And, I, you know, they, they only got me to do it two or three days before the recording. But even with somebody dropped out, there's so many people you go through before you got to me. And this really isn't false modesty. This is just, you know, looking through spotlight and going, <laughs> well, why not him? Why not him? Uh, it was lovely. Yeah, no, I got a phone call. I was uh, visiting my parents in Dorset because, like Jude, I'm obscure yeah. and live in Dorset. And I don't, but I don't live there, but I grew up there. And so I was back there visiting the folks. And I got the call, call from my agent saying, oh, you've got a casting for tomorrow. And I said, yeah, but as you know, I'm, I'm away, so I can't do that. Said, okay. It's, it's for family guy, though. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll come in. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a nothing part. It's an absolute... And this is the other thing that's surprising about it. They had... So it's a British episode. Or I think only a third of it. It's a, fa- a viewer male one. So it's only a, a third of it is... Um, the, the idea is that uh, Family Guy was also based on a British sitcom like The Office, and so this is the original okay. sitcom. It's a uh, funny idea. And so they've got various... The British guest stars they have are Ricky Gervais, Chris O'Dowd, and Tom Hollander. <laughs> and they've got this line, and they're all doing parts, and they've got this line where a continuity announcer basically says, and now the British, I think it's The Price is Right or something. And, you know, no joke to it at all to introduce their little sketch look. Yeah. Why they couldn't have got, you know, <laughs> Tom Hollander to do a voice. <laughs> or, for goodness sake, Seth MacFarlane, who is already doing two British voices in that cartoon, <laughs> to do a third British voice for that nothing line. I don't know, but I'm very glad they didn't. <laughs> Because sometimes you go on IMDb and think someone's put that in as a joke. Yeah. Um, then <laughs> or there's two John Finnemore. Yeah. Because I mean, there is that. There's a Victorian who wrote books about Robin Hood. I was so going to say, yeah, I've, I found oh, out about him. Okay. I was going to say that you were the British school teacher and write a fictional novel and geography text writing about Teddy Lester and his friends at Slapton for Boy's Own Paper, and you died on the 17th of December 1915 of heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah, you know, my, my <laughs> <laughs> this is very much the second act of my. Uh, my favourite of your books in that regard yeah. was a boy scout, a, bo- a boy scout in the Balkans. <laughs> I'd really like to read that book. My favourite is uh, the series of of travel guides for children he wrote called Peeps at Many Lands. <laughs> So it's the title first, so it's John Finnamore, uh, the author first, so it's John Finnamore peeps at many lands. And then each one is called John Finnamore peeps at Israel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. He's and of no course r- what it actually means is John Finnamore is uh, cheerfully and flamboyantly racist about Israel. <laughs> <laughs> because it's 1880, why not? <laughs> or 1910 or something. So was that when you found out about him? Was that a weird moment? Or did you know he's not from your family or anything? Is no, no, he's, uh, there's no connection that I know of. I, uh, I found out about him because uh, my girlfriend at the time gave me a first edition of one of his books. Right. And it's a lovely, one of the school story ones, actually. Yeah. And it's one of those lovely ones with a, you know, a chap in cricket whites catching a ball on the front <laughs> that you see in uh, pubs these days. Um, and so I was really tickled with it and loved it. And then when I started to do this as a career, the egotistical part of me, which is quite a lot of me, uh, got really pissed off because it means, for instance, on Wikipedia, I have to be John Finnamore brackets writer, and the other guy gets to be John Finnamore brackets author. <laughs> I want to be the author. <laughs> oh, I just want to be John Finnamore. That is only one. <laughs> Do you worry that you might be him again, living life again, and you will die at the age of 52? Constantly. Of yeah, 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 yeah. It's become like a weird Woody Allen film style obsession. Yeah, I, can't, I, I hope I can live long enough to see you get to 52, and I'm going to be watching you on tenterhooks. Because it'd be nice if you did. It'd be, not, well, it'd like be cheering, nice, wouldn't it? Like recently this year, cheering the Queen through becoming the longest <laughs> yeah, monarch. Yeah. Oh, I hope she makes it. I hope she yeah. Makes, yeah, she's through. <laughs> I mean, I'd be sad you were dead, but it'd be also really cool if you did die on the, yeah. day, to the day. Yeah. Just be cool. Yeah. I'd go, oh. Wow. Just as I finish, John Finnamore Jr. peeps at Syria. <laughs> Uh, that actually might be why I die. <laughs> Certainly if I take the same attitude the original did. <laughs> and uh, I was listening to you on the Now Show as well. Do you still do, you still do the Now yeah, Show? Yeah, yeah. Um, I try not to listen to the Now Show if I can help it. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm only joking. But you, you get to do like long eight-minute eight minute monologues of it's, your own. I mean, that's what's amazing about yeah. it. I, I really think that the, uh, what is great about the Now Show is that it provides that. There's nothing really like it 
anywhere else, a little platform where different stand-ups or writers or comedians can just do five minutes on a story, on a something they find interesting that may or may not be a, a new story, and they, you know, you can do that in so many different styles. Everyone approaches it their own way, but yeah. but there's a lovely. It's basically like having a newspaper column, but you get to act it as what you, you know. You get to do funny voices as well. Yeah. No, I love it. It's sort of weird to me that in England or UK we don't have. The Daily Show. Of, yeah, you know, and we we God knows we've tried, but yeah. it never seems to work. I don't but know why the, not. It seems to be, you know, that seems to... Well, that, you, you, I was listening to a couple of them, but the, you're probably the most famous one you did was the about the phone hacking, which Yeah, is well, I was so lucky with that one because... Uh, so the week the Millie Downer story broke, the, the way the news quiz, the news quiz, the Now Show works is we meet on the Tuesday and sort of divvy up the stories and work out what the two main sections that Steve and Pete, Stephen Hugh do are going to do, and then... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, anyway, so the story broke, I think, on the Monday or Tuesday, but at that stage it was kind of mostly still about a murdered teenager. It wasn't quite, certainly wasn't clear it was going to become as big as it was, and it wasn't really clear how to do it in a funny way. So they gave it to, I think, I think in fact, they asked me to do it, and I said, yeah, I'm sure I can find something. And then, of course, as the week went on, it became the story of the, you know, obviously the week and then really the month and the year. Uh, and so on the day that we were recording, on the first day, it was when it was really blowing up, and between me finishing the piece, writing the piece like an hour before we went on. In that hour, they closed down the News of the World. Right. And so I had to rush upstairs while everyone else was rehearsing on mics and just frantically rewrite it. Yeah. Because part of my piece had been, was saying, they're going to close News of the World because they were going to anyway. Don't let that, don't take that. They want you just to go, oh no, yeah, hands up, but we've killed the naughty paper that did it and yeah. we're all nice now, don't fall for <laughs> that. And then they did exactly what I predicted and I had to rewrite it as, now they have. <laughs> <laughs> So but it's this. amazing. I mean, the, 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 it's a very good routine. But it's but it's also amazing the way that that story has. They have succeeded, and she's now back working yeah. in the exact same job. It's all what yeah. you warn at the end. You say we have a chance to stop this happening, and we didn't, and yeah, and we didn't really do it. And they've amazingly managed to. Rebecca Brooks has managed to get to the point where she yeah is nothing to do with. <laughs> with anything that happened, I know. and that's accepted. I mean, I mean, Rupert Murdoch, throughout through all of this, he's sitting there as if none of his. I did, I did a show I about page that. three, and and you know, it's always Rupert Murdoch was always on holiday when the decisions <laughs> were made. Right. Going, oh bloody hell, my editors again <laughs> doing. <laughs> only there was some way I could stop them yeah. doing. Stuff. And so you kind of got this idea of this guy at the head of an organisation <laughs> where he has no control over anything at all. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's an astonishing thing. So it's really not, it's really great to see proper satire being done. I, and I just. Well, that was a one of the rare occasions as well, where not only was the story big and important, but yeah. I actually felt like I had... And I, I often don't. I'm often not quite sure what I want to say about it, and I don't want to take the easy, you know, the, the, the route that will necessarily get the big round of applause yeah. on the night, because that's not necessarily the most interesting thing to say about it. But on this occasion, I did feel like there was something specific I could say that wasn't, you know, that, that, was, worth, that was worth saying. Other times, I, when I don't feel like that, sometimes I just sort of do a, a half on one side and half on the other, which, which works as well. Yeah. But there's something very satisfying about, for once, actually having, you know, actually being cross about something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, definitely, it's on YouTube, so you can all, all listen to it. It's definitely worth uh, a listen. I'll ask you an emergency question oh, now. Okay. I've got some new ones. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're pretty good. Uh, so. Uh, Actually, uh, this one, this is, uh, I'll ask this one because this is from the Kickstarter guy. I've only, there's one I haven't asked, so there's someone paid to ask this question. Okay. He's called Steph, and he hasn't given his full name. I'm going to read you his full question. I was once so ill on Uzu that a project, I, project, I, project, I projectile vomited into a woman's handbag. I probably shouldn't have read this one out, actually, thinking about it, <laughs> given, uh, <laughs> given that one feeling all right. that was six <laughs> feet away. It was on its side, and I was on the floor. It looked like calzone. Oh. <laughs> I can. It's kind of. It's a. It's a long time before we get to the question. Okay, I can no right, longer. <laughs> I can no longer drink or smell any aniseed-based drink without wanting to spew my ring. <laughs> I worked in a nightclub in the 90s, and the sambuca craze nearly killed me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, for this information. So, do you have a drink, food, or thing that makes you want to be violently ill when it or a similar is in your vicinity? Um. I think the closest is liver. I think, oh, gosh. I think liver is the thing that I wouldn't, you know, whatever like sitcom situation you could dream up for, where you've got to eat it to please your, you know, your granny or the boss or whatever. I think liver's the one where I just couldn't do it. But really. cooked liver or just I mean, raw liver's kind of disgusting. But you just I didn't liver. even know you could. Oh God, that hadn't even occurred to me. Can you, do people eat raw liver? <laughs> they wouldn't eat it, but you have to handle it. It's a oh, disgusting I see. Right. thing. 
No, I'm, I, it's the cooked one. It's, the, it's yeah. the, the, the way it dissolves in your mouth and the way yeah. it tastes of old coins and the way my <laughs> mouth... It does, though. It's got that horrible metallic, like, licking a battery taste. Oh, I can't stand it. Yeah, it's weird. In the, back in the 70s, before you were alive, mm. uh, they, uh, we used to, you had to eat a lot of entrails and viscera of... <laughs> right. like, there'd be steak and kidney pies. Well, steak is nice, but kidneys yeah. are really... It's not nice. No. In a pie. No. I mean, fucking hell. No, and and there's just five places where you could have put another bit of lovely steak. <laughs> it is. Or even, you know, if, if what you're doing obviously is bulking it out so that you don't have to use expensive steak, yeah. just put in a bit more pastry. <laughs> I'd be fine with that. Just put in a little kidney shaped piece of pastry. Or an, an, an onion would be nice. Or an, an onion. A, bit a lovely, delicious onion. Yeah. yeah. Really horrible. God, you keep wanting us to go back to the old days. They really should have. They haven't thought it through. It's, 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 the, the, the integration of a multi... I bet they love society. a kidney. I bet, you, will probably I bet the typical UKIP voter has a plate of devil kidneys in the morning, like, <laughs> you know, like he's Bertie Worcester. Yeah, it's really horrible. Oh. No, I've no idea what a deviled kidney is. But what is deviling? Do you know what deviling is? It doesn't make it any better. That's why that's no, I know. <laughs> I think probably the deviling is just cutting out something's kidneys. It's, that's quite <laughs> right, a devilish yeah. way to make it. That is what the, the devil would do. The animal is still yeah. alive. Yeah. <laughs> got no kidneys. You're going to find out this is going to be bad for you in a few hours. Um, okay, this is one of my emergency questions. Okay. Why do elephants have such low rates of cancer? <laughs> well, I'm often asked this. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that they did. They, do they? did fight. They have five five percent cancer versus twenty five. But then again, humans. I didn't really know that. Obviously, I knew that. Dogs and cats get cancer. Yeah, I didn't know. Do, I, do, do most animals get cancer? Well, most do. The naked mole rat doesn't really get much Does it not? Uh, well, I'm, I'm guessing because the naked mole rat probably dies quite quickly of other, <laughs> of other right. issues. Of embarrassment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I'm a naked... I'm not just a mole rat, but I'm naked. This is like every bad dream I've ever had. <laughs> the clothed mole rats are going past. Yeah. <laughs> their, their little, their little three-piece suits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Whatever's happened to you, Terence? <laughs> That's how no mole rats speak. Yeah. <laughs> they all vote you kip and eat double kidneys. <laughs> uh, no, but I don't know about the elephants, no. I'm afraid. Well, you know, you can get, we, they don't smoke. No, no, that's true. <laughs> that, that's that's probably true. helps. They have quite yeah. a healthy uh, diet. Yeah, I'm yeah. guessing. <laughs> They're mainly shot by poachers, so they don't get <laughs> right. a chance to develop. And they also have 20 TP53 genes, which is like a smoke alarm, basically, to cancer. It kind of detects the cancer and wipes it out. <laughs> You learn it's stuff like a TED talk. It it's is. You learn, you learn stuff on this podcast, yeah. but you learn the same facts every couple of weeks. Oh, right. <laughs> but that's the best way to kind of really get that home. Um, now, this is a conglomeration of two emergency questions. Would you consider having sex with a ghost as cheating on your partner? <laughs> Yes, I think, I, think the, I think the clue is in the term having sex with. <laughs> yeah. I think if you, so obviously I can see how the two, what the two questions must have been. If you, <laughs> if you accept that you can have sex with something, yeah. then by doing it you are cheating on the person oh, yeah. with whom you promised only to have sex with that person. I've, I've promised only have sex with my wife as, as a person, but I haven't necessarily gone, I haven't said other, I'll have sex with some inanimate it's objects. It's one of those things that don't need to be put into the contract. <laughs> It's one of those, there's nowhere here does it say a dog can't play basketball thing. I, I just, you know, the test is imagining explaining that to your wife and yeah. seeing if she goes, fair enough, I should have put it in the small print. <laughs> you never made it. I don't think it's, it's definitely not cheating for the ghost to have sex with you because it's till death has due part. So the ghost, so the ghost is, now the ghost is in the clear. The ghost okay. can have sex with whoever they want. Fair what enough, if the I'll ghost, because a lot of ghosts that have sex with you, they sort a of- A lot of them, they, yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. A lot. So they fall down into, <laughs> fall into two main types. Right. Well, a lot, I'd say the most of the ghosts that have sex with human yeah. beings essentially rape the human being. I don't think they, they don't, they certainly don't. I, I wasn't aware of this epidemic, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> This is the, the first time I've heard of this. The stories you hear, people say, I woke up and there was this, you know... No, I've never heard that story. Thing, ...and she was having sex with me. So, essentially... Right? You know, you could argue, I reckon. You could say, well, I, even if you did consent to have sex with the ghost, I think you could just tell your wife that the ghost had, had forced themselves on you. Because they're a, they're, a, they're a ghost. Yeah. So, I think you get, could get away with it. And then your wife or partner would feel kind of sympathy for you and you could, uh, you could get a few months of, yeah, well, 
Yeah, yeah sorry, I haven't done have the washing that, up, but remember I was I had that thing with the ghost. <laughs> I'm still recovering, really, from the whole ghost assault. And they'd have to be. Yeah, yeah, now I think that's worth a try, really. <laughs> <laughs> If she catches me, I'd be excited. if she doesn't catch me... Do you I'm have a specific it. ghost in mind? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a ghost um, you've got your eye on. Well, I mean, there's quite a lot of... Sometimes you go to, like, a stately home and there's pictures of an oil painting of a very... You know, you see an attractive woman yeah. from the 16th century and you think, that's sad, I'll never... I wonder if she's still... <laughs> so she then appeared... And, I wonder if she's got any unfinished <laughs> business. <laughs> So, you know, I think there were a few that I'd... Uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Ghost of Marilyn Monroe right. came back. I think if the Ghost of Marilyn Monroe came back uh -huh. and said, I want to have sex with you, you'd have to do that. You would just say, look, I'm, say I'm married, I'm, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime <laughs> opportunity <laughs> to have sex with the Ghost of Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think I have to do it. And right. I will tell my wife... I might ring my wife up and say, look, Marilyn... Yeah, I think that was... Here she is. is. Yeah. Do I get a pass? <laughs> <laughs> you can come and join in and watch. Yeah, if Arthur Miller turns up, you know, there's one piece. <laughs> <laughs> good. That's a, that's a good yeah. emergency. Have you ever seen a ghost? Well, <laughs> since you asked me for a ghost story. <laughs> Sorry, that, that is the closest thing I have to a catchphrase. Um, I, have, I don't think I have because I don't believe in ghosts. However, I have had the experience that people who say they've seen ghosts had, which is presumably some sort of waking dream. Yes, I, I saw a, a, an old Caribbean woman with a child in her arms oh, one you? morning. Yeah. Sorry? Was that, could it just have been an old Caribbean woman? <laughs> <laughs> there is that possibility. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where, was, what, where was she? Uh, it was, was I was on a cycling house? holiday in Cuba, so yeah. I was in the Caribbean, so, you know, it's Leeds. <laughs> I, think this is, I think it was just an yeah. old Caribbean woman. I was in my hotel room, and yeah. I woke up, and I felt completely awake, and I saw this sort of, so she was, there were two single beds in the room and she was kind of between the two single beds sitting down, rocking slightly, holding her baby, and I wasn't scared. Uh, I was just, didn't know what was, didn't understand what I was seeing, and I watched it for, I think, about four or five minutes, and then I got up and wrote it down, just to, you know, I had some sort of memory of it, and then I sort of kept a careful check on whether I was going to wake up, you know, if I was going to go through that waking up, and I, as far as I remember, I didn't, but, I think that's what people who see ghosts must have, some sort of that's working a hallucination. That is a ghost. That's definitely a ghost. I don't believe in ghosts, though. You wrote it down in case you forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. How many, <laughs> what's happening in your life? A, a, a weird Caribbean old woman. I once went to sleep on the floor in a dressing room on a tour when I was hungover and we'd been drinking all day, as we used to on the tour. I used to be like this all the time. And, uh, and I, was, I was woken up by a hag. Uh, on sitting on me, ch trying to choke me. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm possibly trying to have sex with me. I don't know. <laughs> she, that might have been what she was into. Uh, and then she disappeared when I woke up. But then, uh, well, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the stories involve either waking up or being about to go to sleep. Yeah. And surely that's what's going on. I'm well, sure it was for me. The ghosts know that, though, don't they? Well, so that's, that's when true. that's why they appear at that yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not stupid. The ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the ghost agenda then? Do they, <laughs> why, do, do they want us to know they're there or not? They want us to be confused. <laughs> it's just like a big Well, prank. job done, ghosts. <laughs> job done. <laughs> they want to make us feel like we're ridiculous and idiots. I was also listening, you've got a new show out on uh, the radio. It's quite a bit more serious, a bit more serious, the double acts uh, thing. Oh, I wouldn't say it's more serious. Well, it's, it's a bit more, it's, they're a bit more like plays rather than... I suppose uh, so, yeah. They're, um, so I, I, it feels to me like splitting the difference between this sketch show and the... The, the sitcom in that they're, so each one is a self-contained half hour play and they're all for only two two uh, actors yeah. so um, yeah it's uh, what I really like is being able to finish a story in half an hour because obviously with the sitcom which I love doing but and what's great there is you have developing characters that you can come back to but you have to lead them more or less where they started at the end of, you know they've got to care about something massively for half an hour and then more or less be at the same place yeah. at the start of the next episode and particularly on radio where you're expected to more to be able to View, listeners expect to be able to listen to any episode. I do, you know, when I'm yeah. listening to the radio, I don't, I don't, uh, I wouldn't want to be expected to know who these people are. I need to just want to. So, it's a, it's a quite an odd form, you know, it's a, to to write in. It's like a, a it, quite a constraining sort of. It's almost like a, a you know, a poem form, like a yeah. BNL or something, where you have to have so many lines and you have to. It's got. It's got that quality to it, so I'm really enjoying with these being able to come up with a story that massively changes their lives forever, <laughs> and then we never see them. I mean, they don't all have that, obviously, but they all do start somewhere and end somewhere quite different. 
So it's, I've listened. Is the first one out at the moment? Yeah, it's the yeah. first one with Celia Imrie and the guy who uh, played Michael Palin in the. Yeah. Oh thing. God, wasn't he great in that? I mean, yeah, he's he great. It's Charles Edwards. Oh yeah, that's is his name. name. And uh, yeah, I, that was an astonishing performance, wasn't it? it Just, was. I mean, they were all good. All <laughs> the, um, the 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 Python actors I thought were great in that show, yeah. but uh, there was something spooky about how he because Palin isn't really someone who everyone does an impression of is no. that, you know anyone can do their bad John Cleese and Darren <laughs> Boyd did a really good John Cleese yeah. but nobody even does a bad Palin no. you know what how would you do a Palin impression but he just <laughs> he was spot on yeah he does look a bit like him which helps yeah that does but so you, you're kind of attracting very big actors to to your work who else have you got coming up uh, we've got Alison Steadman doing one and uh, John Bird doing one and Amazing. Rebecca Front so yeah the thing is with radio you can get Another good thing about it is that you can get really decent people to do it because it's only a day out of their lives. And actually, the more they're the sort of people who are doing film and TV a lot these days, the more actually being able to just turn up, not have to learn any lines, obviously, do it three or four times in front of an audience or not, and then, you know, go on their way. And yeah. they've done a whole play or a whole, you know, like in, you, you only need to do three days' work and you've done a whole series of sitcom. Uh, and I think that makes quite a, a yeah, nice cool. change for them. Yeah. You know, because on the film they'll do like two minutes a two two minutes a day, and most of that will be sitting in their trailer waiting for planes to go past. Yeah. So. What I find quite interesting about radio now, I think, in the digital age, where you would imagine radio might be sort of diminished, but it it, it isn't. Uh, and like, do you ever think about this that when you listen to uh, six music, radio seven extra or whatever, and they're yeah. playing stuff from. 1973. Yeah, yeah. Would you, will people be listening to your sitcoms in 50 years' time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which oh is God quite. I mean, there's, yeah. there's no sort of reason why not. You know, I really enjoy when those when Navy Lark or something. There was yeah, one yeah. with uh, there was one with the guy from um, uh, Richard Beckinsale. Is that his oh name? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from uh, I never. It was him and a baby called Baby Albert, played by <laughs> um, Beryl Reed or someone like that. No, it's not even Beryl Reed. Does anyone know Porridge. who it is? It's such an obscure sitcom. It's called ba it's Me and Albert or something. It's called. All oh, right. And it's I'm Richard Beckinsale from 1970. Quite good on radio comedy, but yeah, I'd never that. heard of it. Yeah. Um, oh damn, it's going to annoy me now. But never mind. But yeah, <laughs> so it's it's kind of weird. I mean, it's weird that sometimes things from yeah. 1993 that I'm in are on yeah, the radio, yeah. <laughs> and that's quite a long time ago. Well, what's um what's weird and and also lovely for me is knowing that it, increasingly people tell me that their kids really like uh, my radio yeah. shows. And sometimes, you know, like I meet kids, come, like doing, I did a stage show recently and some, you know, it was child friendly and so some children came and I met them afterwards and they kind of quoted bits of uh, cabin pressure at me yeah. and got me to sign stuff. And you think, well, whether it's good or bad, because of the nature of, of childhood, they'll remember, you know, if, if they loved it that much and learned bits of it, they'll still be able to quote that, they'll be quoting that at university and they'll probably quote it all their lives. Even yeah. if it's rubbish, it's in there, just like the, you know, the goons is for me or whatever, you know, that was before my time, but my dad played me a lot of it and so, you know, that's just, that's just in there. Yeah. Um, or <laughs> actually, I'll tell you what though, for, for, for me, one of those main things is the day to day and, <laughs> uh, and on the hour. Yeah. That was the thing, because that was the first thing I discovered, one of the first things I discovered for myself, you know, my dad didn't, didn't introduce me, you know, my dad introduced me to Monty Python, but on the hour was something that I heard and was mine and that I loved. And so, yeah, I've got, I've got bits of that just hardwired into me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. thanks. Well, but really, someone last night told me, uh, he was a, was, he's quite a big executive, he used to work on Vista Fun, funny enough, but he still says to his boyfriend, you am a twat, which is something <laughs> I <said. laughs> you know, And it's, they've lost the, it's like almost like the yeah. genesis that is lost, it's just become a thing. Yeah. Like, uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Now, do you, are you aware of the uh, Dirty Britcom Confessions website? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Only because at a Christmas party, like, my friends and I have this, have this uh, like meet for dinner yeah. before Christmas and, and uh, like a sort of friends version of a Christmas dinner and somebody put we do each other crackers and someone put some of them in my cracker <laughs> and yeah no, I hadn't heard of it before and it was it's I was mortified am I going to be mortified yeah now? I think you are <laughs> I mean, I, to be honest I, I wasn't going to bother looking for you and no offence I've had people on like Diane Morgan the other week I thought there's going to be a lot of filthy stuff about Diane Morgan on no, no one's had a fantasy about Diane Morgan uh, which I find unbelievable. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and that is the highest compliment I can pay. <laughs> but John Finnamore has just fucking hundreds of them. This is the... This is the most... This is like, I'll just see how you feel about this. Um, you know, you know I, know, I already know how so, I'm going to feel about it. Um, see, if you're up for it. Thinking of John Finnamore making me come with just his fingers. <laughs> soon... <laughs> Soon wanting to taste me after, eating me out until I come with his mouth on me, thighs pressing nicely against his fuzzy face. 
Not like you at the moment. Not Clean so shaven at the now. moment. <laughs> Fingers slightly tugging his hair as he licks until I've come down. Uh, he holds me close. Oh not ex- is this? <laughs> is this a novel? Not expecting reciprocation, but I do so want to, and bring him to climax by hand. I'd find that disappointing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've done. I mean, she's we're not even finished there. Yeah, Does you've she... done a lot of work there, John. <laughs> <laughs> you've done. I put my fuzzy face <laughs> to good use there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then a little hand job. In the hand, and that just like now, you, once you're over sixteen, and I. <laughs> and jobs the work. I mean, even doing it to myself now, I find quite boring. I never thought that would be the case. Just have to pretend you're a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> but so, maybe if I could de- actually inject my arm so it died. Yeah, you should do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah no, I think that's then it would scheme. literally be a ghost. Yeah. that would make it more enjoyable. But it's, you know, it's not great, is it? It's not a hand job. It's not a great way of. Anyway, it's not finished. Uh, what? <laughs> My name on his lips as he does so. So she's okay. I think it's a girl. She's wa- she's wanking off, and you're going, oh, Sandra. Oh, oh, it's just not as good because, especially at like a what? I can imagine like another guy could do it quite well, but like a woman doesn't hasn't had enough experience to do the hand job efficiently. I don't really like having my foreskin yanked back as far as it'll go. <laughs> I know a lot of men like that don't do carry on doing that, ladies. It's just me. I don't when they really just when they squeeze it. I don't like that, so that is that wouldn't work for me. Okay, uh, it goes well, on. Um, Richard, our session's nearly up for this one. <laughs> <laughs> he kissing me sweetly after he holds me tight, we dozing off in each other's eyes. I've written we dozing off in each other's arms. That person can't even write. That's Which nice, be, I like that bit. Yeah, you like that. That's, that. I mean, there's sort of sweetness to that. Yeah. Uh, this is another one. Good, good. <laughs> I was hoping there would be. Frenzied primal, throwing each other against oh. every surface, hair every pulling. Every surface? Yeah. Crikey. <laughs> Casping. I just can't. I Ceiling? I mean, yeah. that's a lot of surfaces. <laughs> I just can't. I'm not, I'm or not does she mean different textures? <laughs> you know, <laughs> throwing me against, you know, sawdust and then... <laughs> Pebble dash and then all the all the all the surfaces, yeah, <laughs> marble, <laughs> hard pounding daytime quickies and exquisitely excruciatingly slow spoony morning sex with John Finnamore, heaven. Well, it, 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 it does sound nice. I don't imagine. <laughs> I don't imagine you when I'm imagining having sex with you. Yeah. I don't imagine you being all that. I just think you're. I think you'd be quite straight up and not do stuff like that. Well, thanks a bunch. I think you'd be quite. <laughs> I picture you as quite... So you didn't think I'd be on this side, <laughs> and you don't think I'm any good in bed. I don't think... That's not what I think about when I think about you. All right. Um, wow. I would totally... I'll prove you wrong. <laughs> I will not prove him wrong. <laughs> I would totally kneel in front of John Finnamore, sucking him and licking his cock, and let him come all over me. That's just one of my... That's a delightful uh, so... <laughs> uh, Let's see if there's... Oh, there's so many. There's so many in here. <laughs> I, is this, I mean, I don't feel know free it, to skip some. No, I have to skip one. I want to be John Finnamore's wet-nosed cub. Does that mean, is that a reference or something? Yeah, that's a line from Miranda, which okay. I pop up in as a, okay. a guest star. Is it a, a, is it a sexual role? No, playing? no, it's a utterly, um, it's a, me and Margaret playing oh, yeah. a, uh, a revolting friends who are first to be very lovey-dovey and then awful baby, you know, um, people like, People who've just had a baby, yeah. they're the first people who have ever invented it, that, yeah. that sort of yeah, character. Yeah, I hate those people. Those, those <laughs> bastards always going on and on and on about their boring... boring <laughs> yeah. Don't know if you met anyone like that. Uh, here's another, this one I quite like. Before I'm 30, I would like to spend an entire day in bed with John Finnamore. It's like, that's like one of those bucket list things. They, that's, in the, that's, in the, that's in the list. You must climb Mount Kilimanjaro, do a parachute jump, spend a day in bed that, with John Finnamore. That's a reference to a sketch I did oh, about those, uh, oh. about those lists and how horrible they are yeah. and how I don't, you know, the last thing I need is, <laughs> is some pressure to go to Bali or to go swimming <laughs> with sharks. You know, that's, anyway, so yeah, that's what that's all about. I get aroused by John Finnamore in a dressing gown. I mean, I could go on. I mean, don't feel you have to. <laughs> I might do. <laughs> Sometimes when John Finnamore gets insomnia, he stays up doing a Q&A on Twitter. I can think of more fun things he could be doing, and I'll happily volunteer to join him next time he can't sleep. Scrabble. She's talking about yeah, Scrabble. It could be, it could be that. <laughs> so, you know, just be aware that 
as you're I've got doing options. those Q&As. That's, no, good. That's good to hear. Just ask, you know. I mean, I mean do they come with emails? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no, I'm the, not interested. The thing I don't really understand about this website is most comedians, if you just say, can I throw you against every surface and, yeah, and yeah. suck your cock, they'll go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most of them will go, yeah. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about it. And you've been on I'm Sorry, I Haven't a Clue. That's, oh, that's that was pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, terrifying, but uh, they were lovely. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, as I was saying, growing up with growing up with radio comedy and that was absolutely one of my favorites and yeah. to actually yeah to be on it and then I've, I've been on it twice now because once I I was sort of on it properly as it were and then I stood in at last minute when um, Barry Cryer had any infection he was fine but he couldn't do it that's the good thing about um that they're all so old <laughs> that there will be a lot of chances to sit in and but because that was at a moment's notice, that meant that I got to do a, um, a Hamish and Dougal sketch <laughs> oh, really? with, that Graham Garden had written with Graham Garden as Angus and Dougal. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, can you imagine? That was absolutely fun, amazing. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, where do you get your crazy ideas from, though? Ah. Where do you... Where do you <laughs> crazy you ideas. How do you come up with all this, that stuff? Where's it... How does it was it drug, I mean, drug, take drugs? Do you it's, think uh, you ideas? Well, I mean, firstly, as you were as you were hinting earlier, my ideas aren't that crazy. <laughs> you know, how do I come up with my dull pedestrian ideas about sketches in shops? Well, <laughs> no, I, um, I mean, mostly the dull answer is mostly just by that being the job and sitting down with notebooks on trains often and trying to come up with ideas very rarely. Yeah, but where do they ha- where do they come from then? Do where do they know? actually come where from? Where do they come from? How do you come up with them? I can, I mean, I was in a pub garden. I took you, I mean, yeah. I, I, is this a serious? I can tell no, you how one. No, but tell me. Right. Right. <laughs> Nothing serious, but you know, it's, sometimes it well, leads. this is interesting, because this is like, this is a three-legged dog that gave me two different sketches. Okay. okay so I was in the pub garden trying to think of ideas, and three-legged, three-legged dog ran past, sat at the bottom of a tree, and sort of quivering with excitement, because there was a pigeon at the top of the tree, and he was just sort of, quivering, looking up at them, and it just seemed to me like he was saying, if only I had my other leg, I would get you. <laughs> and so that struck me as funny, and uh, so I wrote that down, and then nothing came of it, because that's a like, funny thing to have noticed, and maybe if I was a stand-up or wrote for a stand-up, I could have made something out of that, but there's no real way of putting that into a sketch. And I'm going to condense this down, but basically, I just sort of, well, what's, what was funny about it is a sort of unknowingness of, uh, there's, and then there's, the, and anyway, it eventually came into, one was through, a, one turned into one page became a sketch about Quasimodo uh, and how Victor Hugo uh, sort of coming back to the cathedral and saying, Quasimodo, I've written a book about you. Oh, I'm so honored. I've taken all those tales and I've written them up into, uh, oh, this is wonderful. And I've I've given you the first edition as a gift of my new book, The Hunchback (laughs) of Notre Dame. You called it what? (laughs) Uh, And then the other one became a sketch about a dog waking up in the vet and going, oh God, I'm here again, this awful place. Oh God, last time they, last time they took my, no, no, it's fine. But, uh, you know, they sort of, oh God, I've, I've done this wrong because I've mis- missed up the setup. But it was about <laughs> how a dog who's had his leg, had one leg amputated for very good medical reasons because his owner loves him and he's paying a lot of money for it, how he'd feel when he woke up and went, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> So I have really, really massacred telling that sketch. Uh, that's but, good. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I get my ideas from, three-legged dogs. Yeah, mainly from... I get a lot, but I have a lot of ideas that I can't... But there's a lot of, I, nearly all my ideas, I think that'd be a good episode of Man Down with Greg Davis. <laughs> the other day, like a waitro, they had a waitrose delivery. That's mm. who I, that's who Doing I'd okay. <laughs> and the guy... And it came really early in the morning. I'd forgotten it was coming to the door. And the guy ran the doorbell, and I've got like a, an answer phone thing. So I said hello, and then it was just this like a zombie going, oh, 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 and I was going, so, hello, I can't hear, oh, 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 and then I saw his hand pressing oh, against the glass. <laughs> oh, oh, and I was like, oh, so what's going on? And then I kind of remembered it was the delivery, and I went to him, and it was like then it was a deaf guy oh, delivering right, right. the. And then he was going, I'm sorry, I'm deaf. And I was going, oh, God, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I was just, re- it was really early in the morning. I was confused. And that kind of real embarrassment of, yeah. you know, some, but then actually genuinely scared, thinking, it, not that yeah. it was a zombie, but that some, someone yeah, was, was, something. That was yeah. attacking my hand. I don't know why he put his hand on me. It was just so... Because <laughs> <this place>. yeah. <laughs> I think he also just that knocked on the door. That makes you think he knew well. a little bit about what he was doing. <laughs> 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 about there too. And what we once went to... A, and this is, I don't know, we might cut this out, Dave, but this would be a very good Greg Davis episode. This, we went to a solicitor to make, have a will made, and, uh, and about halfway through, I noticed that the solicitor had one really massive hand. <laughs> like, really massive. <laughs> just, seriously, right. just this big hat. And I looked, and then I was looking at my wife and going, <laughs> 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 that big, 
and then you're not wanting to mention it because yeah. you know what it's about. But then it's just like real, like it's like you're in a sketch. Yeah. And there, you know, and, and I think you know, I can imagine Greg Davis, for example, or someone like being in that situation and yeah, being, yeah. finding it funny. Yeah. But then discovered that it was some complication. I looked afterwards. It's some complication from some awful cancer that leads to that. Oh, to yeah. So it's not at all funny, but in a Greg, in a, but it's sort of weird when suddenly halfway through a conversation with someone, you notice something like yeah, that, and then you yeah, don't yeah. know what to. Yeah. That's where I get my crazy ideas <laughs> from. <laughs> um, but we might cut that out because that's probably too much information. She might. Um, oh, we're, we're, if we're cutting, then cut out me trying to explain one of my. No, no, that's staying in. That's staying. Well. <laughs> She's probably dead now. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> She did a terrible job on the wheel, I have to say. So, <laughs> yeah, she genuinely did. They know we never got it in the end. It was awful. Oh. She was awful. If you if you go to that woman, you'll know who it is. When you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let, I'll ask you. I thought, I thought I had some more new. I've got lots of questions about. I mean, this is now getting untopical. Uh, have oh, you no. ever put your genitals in the mouth of a dead animal? I have not had that honour. No, no. Living animal. No, no, sorry. I mean, maybe you're right about me being very b bad in bed, <laughs> yeah. very, very unadventurous, but no. A human being is an animal, so you just uh. admitted you've never had oral sex. Uh, I would. <laughs> Sport is intrinsically stupid. Discuss. <laughs> There's not much to discuss, is there? I mean, it just <laughs> is. Yeah, I mean, it is intrinsically stupid. I, I mean, it appears to be the rugby is still happening. Mm. And we, the rugby's been going on. All year, on the year, four years. I, I can't remember a time before the rugby. It's just always been rugby now. We live in, in a time of rugby, and uh, yeah. I mean, no, it's not intrinsically. It's just, I just, but I don't understand why it's one of the most important things. I don't yeah. understand why it's like the back page of every paper and, and the whole channels. And no, I don't get that. It's a game. I love games. Yeah. But you don't get. Yeah. Why isn't Why isn't Scrabble there? Yeah, I like Scrabble. I think oh. Scrabble should be televised more. <laughs> just people just thing is, I wouldn't watch it if it was. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I still, point. yeah, no, I, I, I don't really get sport. I thought in the Rugby World Cup, like England just lost to Wales in that game really close. It was really close. And if they'd won, they'd probably have gone through. And if they like, they just made one, like, they had one yeah. really close game and everyone's going, oh, England are rubbish. And they didn't, they nearly beat one of the game and then they didn't quite win it. I know. Just cut them some and it's just when you stop, arbitrarily when you stop, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I know it's not, and I know I'm, this is, yeah, uh, like schoolboy whining, but yeah, it does. I, I, I can't really get it. I suppose it's because it's so badly plotted. Obviously, when you see a good one, it's amazing. When you see, uh, I, every so often, if it's a World Cup or something, I'll get into it. And when you see a good one, it's great. And you see, oh, now I finally see what all the fuss is about. And then you watch another one, and it's a nil-nil draw. And there's no plot. You know, there's no... <laughs> uh, you think, well, I could have watched a movie. That was 90 minutes. And nothing... I don't mean that nothing happened. Even if stuff happens, it didn't make a good story. I wasn't satisfied by the end. The underdog didn't either win or tragically, you know, or maybe, or they did, but it was just random. It felt, yeah, yeah unearned. Good. If you had to go on a week's holiday with one of the puppets from Spitting Image, <laughs> which okay. puppet would you choose? And, and remember that the puppet would choose the holiday destination. Do you remember that? Oh, of course, that? yeah. Those, those <laughs> are... <laughs> Rem yeah, you're right to, 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 to say remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've always known they were all, but I, uh, yeah, I and have forgotten. So it would be like, obviously, this speaking of trouble isn't alive. It's not ridiculous. It's not, we're not living in a fantasy world. No, no. Uh, the operator and the impressionist oh, okay. would accompany you on the holiday, but they right. would ne you would never be able to talk directly to them. Okay. They would only address you through the puppet. <laughs> and if you, if you attempt to interact with them in any way, they would just pretend they weren't there okay but they would be there yeah but you wouldn't know that you know they right. to all intents and purposes they so steve they wouldn't coogan wouldn't if it was neil kinnock steve coogan would be in the room doing the voice yeah and c keeping up the conversation but you couldn't go hey steve what about um the trip how was that Being, right. you couldn't do any of that no you could only talk to neil kinnock go, hey, hey what are you saying right so <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's neil, a, neil that kinnock. sounds like a dream holiday certainly. yeah <laughs> But um, you don't have to take Neil Kinnock, but you can take... No, him. okay. And when you say they make the decision, who... <laughs> I mean, the impressionist or the, the puppet? The puppet, the, you know, they're, right, all, they're all working together. All right. In character. They will be living in character. In all right, because basically I'm, I'm taking a very cynical attitude to this. I'm just going to try and get the nicest holiday I can out of it. Uh, because there's nothing that appeals to me about <laughs> going on holiday with, with two people who won't talk to me and a rubber <laughs> puppet that will. <laughs> But if I can pick the one who'll take me to, you know, St. Lucia, then, um, 
that's that's I think my that's the way to profit from this situation. Michael so Winner. Michael, Michael Winner. Winner. Yeah, Michael I mean, Winner, happy with Michael that. Winner, Princess Diana, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who did those voices? Because <laughs> now I have to. No, but you're right. I don't. I don't get to spend any time in the impression. It doesn't so, matter because yeah. they would just. Alan be... Wicker. I'll go with Alan Wicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we'll go on a whole tour of lovely places. What's there an Alan, Alan Wicker, Wicker there must though, be. It would be someone pretending to be Alan Wicker who wouldn't have the probably the knowledge of Alan Wicker, but would just. I don't need the knowledge. I just need the the, the ticket. Basically, okay, I'm just perfect. after the free holiday. I'm th I'm taking a very joyless attitude to this joyful question. In a way. It's just... It's a stupid question. Right? Oh no! Uh, so don't be too hard on yourself, Richard. I think it's a very intelligent question. I've just I've just addressed it very badly. Okay. <laughs> Let me just check. There's nothing serious I have to ask you, and then we'll uh, I might ask you some other stupid stuff. Okay. I haven't got I haven't got a watch at the moment. That's right, we're right. doing all right for time. Um, we can we could do a lot more of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were on Only Connect. Oh yeah, I was. Yeah. How did you get on? Uh, we lost, but only on a time break. Okay. Yeah, which was disappointing. But we we solved the wall. We we uh, we, got, we completed the wall and got all the. It's quite hard only connect. I've I've mm -hmm. be, I've become. It's easier only if you're a celebrity one. Is <laughs> it? <laughs> but yeah, it's still quite. I've hard. I've become obsessed with uh, tipping point. Oh, I haven't seen tipping, tipping point. point no. <laughs> I love I love quiz shows, and yeah. in fact, what I quite like having a baby, and I've looked after the baby on uh, Thursday. I don't know, go on about it. Uh, but it's quite good because, you know, she can mainly look after herself. I mean, last night we just left her, you know, she's asleep, so we can yeah. go out, can't we? Uh, so, uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I looked after all day and I just went for lunch. I had a nice slap up lunch on my own, had a beer. It was great. Lovely. Uh, and then I just went home and watched quizzes. It's kind of what I want to do. As oh, a, I see, but it was life. all legitimised because yeah. you were actually, oh, look, I'm doing day daycare. Yeah, I'm oh, I hadn't baby. thought of that. Yeah. So, like, so I, you know, you could, if you get home at about two o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon, you can just watch quizzes. Right. Pretty much through to eight o'clock. I mean, if you go on to Challenge TV, you can right. run all day, but that's cheating. Uh, yeah. but, uh, so the Tipping Point's brought me a bit closer to that because that's on quite early. Do you watch Tipping Point? I'm afraid not, no. I really want to no. do a celebrity version. I was quite, I've talked about it before in podcasts, and I was quite disparaging towards it, and I regret that now. <laughs> it's, you, know, you, you know what it is? They put, it's like those two, you know in the fa fun fairs where you put two P in a machine and there's shelves and they move and then you get yeah. two P's coming out? It's that. But with <laughs> it's not. <laughs> what, on television? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. with, uh, with quiz questions thrown in to All decide right. how many... Oh. No, there's a lot of luck in the game, I would say. <laughs> it's based on quite a lot of good fortune. Okay. Uh, so stupid people can get through to the, to the final. But they did, didn't they do heads or tails as a quiz they did. format? I mean, once you've done that, you think, well, all satire of, of stupid quiz shows is impossible <laughs> because somebody did make a half-hour show about tossing a coin. <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, all quiz shows are just heads or tails, aren't they? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just cut it down to it. But Ben Shepherd does an excellent job on Tipping Point. I want to. I've been disparaging about. It. I want to make it clear. It's a, I'd really love to go on. Because <laughs> you've got to. Dis the, my favourite bit is you've got to discuss what as it's going down because that's quite a boring bit of telly. You have to. He goes. I mean, what it it sounds like a says, collection of boring bits. He says, uh, "What do you think's going to happen?" <laughs> <laughs> And they always go, I don't know, really, it depends on where it falls and what, which, whether it, should we just wait and see what happens? No, what do you think, what do you think, is that a good place? Yeah, it could be. Hard to know it, until gravity's taken its well, effect. Well, I gather that's, that's quite a lot of deal or no deal, isn't it? As well, it's just what do you think's in the box, what's likely to be in the box, what won't be in the box, given what was in the box last time, and you're just, yeah. I mean, we don't, won't know until you open it. Sorry, that's like a really outdated piece of stand-up that <laughs> I didn't even do. But um. I, I went to whoever makes um, Deal or No Deal, mm -hmm. and I suggested doing like a late night, like a poker commentary over the top of it. Nice. To yeah. replay it late at night with some people, actual mathematicians. Yeah. Saying just yeah, doing there that. is no, no Lebman says that box thirteen always has a low number in it, but there is no justification right. for that. Yeah. <laughs> it has happened. It hasn't even happened that much in the last few games. Yeah. <laughs> I would watch that. <laughs> it's too, big, yeah, yeah. too big, and that, that's not true. <laughs> they, it's equally likely to be in any of the boxes. Right. They have not made a foolish decision because you're offering them some free money, so it doesn't matter if there's more money in their box, they have still won. Right. Because he, he did it. Did you see the episode where Noel Edmonds was. Did, did Sarah, Sarah Millican was the host, and, and, no. and Noel Edmonds was the guest? Because she oh. should have really fucking laid into him, because every time. Well, if they get to the end of that game and someone's got, oh, you took £15,000 and there was £20,000 in your box, so you've lost. <laughs> and he did the same thing. You know, there was no right. kind of... 
you, you don't know do you, the, the decisions made before we know the yeah. full answer. Yeah, yeah. If there was, if it was say, you could, do you want fifty thousand pounds or twenty five thousand pounds? And you said twenty five thousand pounds. He goes, no, you, 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 yeah. you have lost yeah. there. You yeah. should have chosen <laughs> fifty thousand pounds. You have lost that the game better. of remembering which numbers are larger than other numbers. <laughs> remembering the order numbers come in. That's yeah. the game you've lost there. So but do you like quiz? Yeah. Like, are you more the snooty intellectual? I, well, mastermind it's only not connected. that so much it's just that I get really I've got a horrible guilt I, I just watching television when the sun's up yeah. just makes me feel I mean of course I enjoy it like everyone else but I don't do it because it makes me feel so guilty it's not worth it yeah. the kind of the awful you know crushing oh god I'm not I'm wasting my life feeling have a just, baby and then you can watch the well yeah no, or just get really like old Okay. So I'm really looking forward um, to being really old because I'm just going to play Adam Sumley Pinball in the morning, yeah. all morning, on my okay. iPad, iPad, and then watching quizzes in the afternoon. Sounds Might do good. a Sudoku, or Kikurus, I like. Do you like Kikurus? No. Don't have to say it, but it's like a Sudoku, but you have to um, add the numbers up. Okay. I'll show you later. <laughs> <laughs> I like a crossword. I like a cryptic crossword. They're fun. No, it's too hard. No? Okay. That is much. <laughs> that is much. This date is going really badly. That's <laughs> much. <laughs> And you work, you work quite a lot, of course, with uh, future guest and past guest David Mitchell, who's on mm -hmm. in a couple of yeah. weeks. Yeah. And so you wrote, do you write together on the soapbox thing? Is that that was finished? Yeah, now? the soapbox. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, again, it, we never really decided to finish it, but it, I think it's probably gone away now. Um, I, and that was great because it was uh, uh, such a nice way of working. Is basically, I would just we go to the pub together. I would get him worked up about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, I would write down all of the, uh, you know, like the effortlessly funny things he just says about, because he's, he's got that kind of mind, which is why he's so good on panel shows and so on. Yeah. The, the first way, which is so unlike me, that the first way he expresses it is, you know, is, is terrific. And then he has to kind of struggle to remember how he put it first. Yeah. Whereas with me, I just have to rubbish out something like I've been doing all evening. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, what I won't have the luxury of doing is going back and saying, oh no, there was something in that, in that long, boring story about, you know, whatever. And, and refining it and refining it until I make it funny. So, yeah, I, I just get David annoyed about tiny things, uh, write down <laughs> everything he says in increasingly drunken handwriting, and then go away and sort of shake them up into three minute pieces. But it's all his stuff, it's all so his ideas. So, that's where you get your crazy ideas from. From David, David Mitchell. <laughs> yeah. that's, where I get, that's where I get David Mitchell's crazy ideas from. I get them from David Mitchell. Yeah, it seemed the obvious place to go. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been writing like uh, you write sort of sketch shows. You wrote for the one Ronnie, which is the most tragic title oh, for, a, for a sketch show there has ever been. I know. And then they started trying to do it with other. Uh, I don't think it lasted very long, but they did. I think they did the one Jasper for Jasper <laughs> Carrot. And you think that makes no sense at all? <laughs> it was tragic, as you say, when it was the two Ronnie. But at least they were called that. <laughs> It'd be quite good if that became the system now that everyone had to be called the one, the one Richard Terry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, they did, I think they did the one Lenny and the one Jasper. But, really? but uh, yeah, I mean, as uh, the show's perfectly good, but the title's not so good. <laughs> uh, did you meet Ronnie Corbett when you were writing for it, or did you just write it and, and hand it in, and then that was the end of that? I uh, was away when they were, I w was sort of invited, but I couldn't go, mm. sadly, so that was the end of that, and it went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the time I didn't meet Ronnie Corbett. Looks like a prick, though, doesn't he? Like oh, I hadn't heard that. I hope not. <laughs> no, he seems very nice. <laughs> He's very, you know, I love these. I love the old guys who keep going. Oh yeah, but they're, you know, they're going like that. But they're taking all our work, aren't they? <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons didn't start doing Just a Minute till he was like my age. Yeah. And has been doing Just a Minute for forty years. I mean, yeah. that gives you some yeah. kind of hope, doesn't it? That yeah, no. This could still be going on in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this, this literally this interview. This. <laughs> <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> um, I think I think we may have, have uh, you know got everything we need. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I liked your sketch about the sun wearing sunglasses. That was amusing. Thank you very much. You that. Thank that you. made me laugh this morning. I liked your sketch about the cool teacher. Well. <laughs> that, that, that made me laugh. Well. We're just saying sketches we like. <laughs> 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 um, and oh, what happened? So what? You did a, you wrote a sitcom for uh, Robert Lindsay and uh, Richard Griffiths. Yeah. And I, I know half the reason why that <laughs> probably isn't going on at the moment. Yeah. But did it? Did, did that? Did that was broadcast as a pilot, was it? No, it no. was broadcastable, as it were. If it, if they picked up the series, then the pilot we made would have gone out as part right. of the series. So it was all you know, like proper. But uh, it didn't happen. 
No. Yeah. So it's that was so hard, isn't it? I mean, we were talking about this backstage because I've I've written a lot of TV. I mean, it's just very hard to get TV shows on. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing, to, you know. It's amazing when you get to that stage. It's all the excitement. Oh, we're, we're filming. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, we've cast Robert Lindsay, and, and, and then and just then once you are on set and people, you know, like whole teams of people, and it seems such a, it, you know that it's not. You know that this is only a pilot and it might not happen, but it seems so real and there's so much, you know, money and time being spent on it and so much effort. You think, yeah, but it's going to happen now, isn't it? I mean, they won't just throw this away. Yeah, they they will. <laughs> <laughs> if they decide they won't want, they don't want it. They will just not. Put but it you out. know, there's going to be disappointment at some point. You even you yeah. get the series, then you do another series, and they go, we don't want any more. So you're, you're going to feel that kind of well, abject that's misery. One of the reasons, the I, not the main reason, but that was what was nice about cabin pressure. I did yeah. decided I wanted to, to, to pick when it, when it finished. Because yeah. otherwise, it either doesn't get recommissioned or it starts to you know go off and people say they don't like it as much as they used to or you get sick of it or, yeah. you know, so... It but was 27 nice episodes is a good whack. I mean, I, th yeah. I feel like the people are a bit... I mean, I, we, I wrote Time General Please where we did 37 episodes. God, you Which were writing like two episodes a week or something. Well, I was writing an episode. I wrote an episode, an episode a, a week. week. I can't imagine doing that. How did you possibly do it? Uh, I had to because otherwise everyone else had nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so but it was it was insane like because actually from nothing. From you had to come up with the. You started without a plot and yeah, you yeah. finished with a, a script ready for them. I to did. Read. Yeah. I, um, I, mean, I, I because they gave us nine. Well, they, we, they commissioned fifteen. Yeah. Then halfway through the series, they gave us another nine. So uh, the right. first few I'd written with, with Al, or we'd yeah. been in the room together, then we'd realise once we got going it was easier for me to do it and email yeah. him and say, send me a joke about this. Yeah. Uh, but by that stage he was... Re so it would, we'd film on a Thursday, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would be... Well, basically, we'd, you know, I'd finish the scripts on Tuesday. <laughs> and so then the next day I'd start writing the next one. We'd yeah. have a read-through of what I had on Friday, which was usually quite bad. Right. And I'd go over the weekend and work that out, and then on the Monday that we'd do a read through what I had right. knock all the edges off it and then I would give it to them and I would then start on the next one on the Tuesday or the Wednesday good lord so for about 10 weeks the good thing was though that meant what I was getting paid was my weekly wage which was insane <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a car with a brand new car with one week's wages <laughs> so it was, uh, right. it was sort of insane but, uh, but yeah it was quite hard work I don't know again I couldn't do that now but, I, but I'd like, I think we were talking about this backstage, it's just when there's a deadline, Oh yeah, yeah. you have to get stuff done. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, that's what I'm like, if I've got time to do something, I'll just take all the time and do it at the last minute yeah. anyway. And I don't think the, the quality team. massively... Well, it was good, because I'd done 15 episodes, so you knew all the characters and you knew how it worked, yeah. and there were kind of catchphrases and things that yeah. came in. Uh, but it's but still plots. That's yeah, the thing the that takes me all the time, and I can't yeah. imagine how you could come up with a... I, you know, I don't think I could. Well, I could maybe plot it in a week, but I well, certainly could. I tell you where I get my one. crazy ideas from. If you would, I've been wondering. Uh, I know I, the way I write, though. I, I, I don't like to really plot out in advance, so I would, so I can be surprised uh, by the twist. Okay. And then I'll go back and rework it. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. So that you know, there would you'd work out something and then something and then see okay. where it went. And sometimes I was aiming for something, but often I wasn't, and that right. meant that. Especially when I was writing them in a week, which often meant the surprise was a surprise to me as well. <laughs> 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 then it sort of occurred to you, so you'd write it as it was, which I, I, I do tend to write like that. It's not right. a great way. It's not a good way to write. I don't think. No, it works for some people, but I can never, I can never do it that way. I can't start until I've got the ending. Yeah. But yeah, I know. But yeah. then I, could, I think sometimes if you do that, then that's why you, you can. I'm not saying you, but one can end up with. You know, formulaic. Yeah, yeah, slightly absolutely. formulaic stuff because you're aiming for something. Whereas if you don't aim for something, you yeah. might find something that's actually oh, absolutely. Spring. You know, lots of great writers do it that yeah. way. I think Evelyn Waugh said when he because he changed over the course. Uh, it of is very like Evelyn Waugh, Time Gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is it's very similar. He said something like, um, "I had the facility when I was young to wind up my characters like clockwork and see where they went," and that just sounds like. Uh, impossible to, I mean, wonderful. I wish my characters would do that, but when I've occasionally tried, even like with, you know, so with Kevin Pressure, where I had characters who I really knew inside out and I knew how they'd react to any situation, and so I do, I suppose, what you're talking about. Think of, a, think of the premise, set them going, and they just sit there. They just talk, <laughs> they just back and forth, and nothing would move, and no one would want anything, and no one would care about anything, and I just couldn't, yeah. Yeah. Brain I did find that I, no, that's why I, I, felt once you, I felt once they were established as characters. I found the second series very. There was a bit short the second series. Yeah. Uh, but I found it really easy to write. Whereas where, we were we were finished way in advance of everything. 
I'm really unlikely. What, you're, you're weak? So yes. you're a weak writer. You're so, on Tuesday, you were going, well, I'm <laughs> done now. So, uh. I didn't write them in a week, but I actually, I think we wrote most of the scripts before the series began, you know, right. which was quite, even when we were doing the, the first 15, I was still working on them as we did. Because I like working with the actors. I like to, yeah, hearing yeah. the actors read it, and then when yeah. they read it, you learn, you oh, learn yeah, so, so much, much more. Yeah. And they inject a bit, and yeah. sometimes they can't do it, so you take that joke <laughs> yeah. out. Uh, but, so, yeah, so I, I, I found, that's why I, but I think, like, in, in Britain, I like, hear a lot of American writers saying, oh, I love the British system where they do 12 shows and they leave it at that. I sort of feel it's a bit lazy. I feel mm. like if you've got great characters, it's, you can come up with at least 30 or 40 and sometimes 50 or 60. Yeah, sometimes, you know, yeah. And, and I mean, Peep Show is well, mostly written by yeah. two guys and yeah. they've written, they've, I think they've done 100 now. Right. I mean, they've done it, but they've done eight series. And, and you know, The Simpsons is the first, there's a good 120 episodes before that starts to not well, quite yeah, as good. But I mean, that's got, I mean, obviously the main difference is the Americans have got loads of writers yeah, working yeah. on it. But as you say, there are people, well, Roy Clark wrote every episode <laughs> of. Of the um, uh, Last of the Summer Wine, yeah. and and is still and uh, yeah, he did write every episode of Last of the Summer Wine when he wrote the first episode of Last. <laughs> of <the> Summer Wine. <laughs> God bless him. Uh, so anyway, look, we better go because I've got very, I've got my main guest coming on uh, in the second <laughs> half. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, uh, it's, we've All been right. very much looking forward. To, it'll be worth hanging around for that, John. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah, were not. You're not going to believe. This. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saved me talking about time, gentlemen. Please with him anyway. So that is good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to really regret that you spent a big chunk of that talking about your career. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad time management. Was, I, mean, yeah. I, I was enjoying it. I was fascinated. But if I were you, I'd have kept that for the second half. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive round of applause to John Vinamore. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. God knows what the next question is going to be like. Thank Here we go. Thank you very much. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>